Live. Sweet. Maybe it's a little dark in here today. I don't know. Got some uh, some lava lamps and stuff kicking around. But I just want to chill in this room and, and think about martial arts. That's what we like to talk about. Um, this series I call Water, the Study of Martial Arts. You know what? Let's tip up this light just a touch. Nah, screw it. We're good. Uh, I like to call this um, this little se series Water, the Study of Martial Arts. And uh, this is the deep dive stuff where we're trying to explore, I guess. We're going to follow our curiosity. A lot of the time, I don't know what's on this. Oh, T Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. My wife is a huge fan. Um, we are going to explore curiosity and we're going to dig into things. I'm going to share with you the research that I've been doing, the people, and there'll be some comments. I'll, I'll try to get to them at the end, so I might not notice them. So please let other people know that might not be there because I am already a fragmented thinker. And you get even more that way these days, doing these one minute analysis pieces it makes your brain move a lot quicker. But uh, so a lot of the time when we talk in water, I'm going to share with you the research that I've been doing. So I get interesting ideas or curiosities. Then I will go to some expert friends of mine. So today I want to talk to you about some, uh, some materials that my friend Dr. Tracy Trudeau has sent me about epigenetics as it relates to artistry, to martial artists. I want to talk to you about something Dr. Stu McGill, who is on the forefront. I've talked about him before. He's at BackFitPro in Instagram. Please tell him I sent you. Um, he, is, he studies how the nervous system works in the elite of the elite athletes, how ideas work from the brain through the nervous system and express through the body, um, and others. And so my, the questions that arise, what I'm trying not to do is try to speak from any area of expertise because I find, as I look at the world, we're a whole bunch of people expressing opinions about things that we're barely informed about. And that'll always be so. No matter what we know about martial arts today, or politics, or cars, or space, in 20 years we will know much more and we will look stupid if we talk so certainly about things, you know? Um, so where we're going today, hey guys, if somebody could also let my friends know that uh, I'm not gonna answer as many little um, questions till the end today, if that's all right. So I've got a pen here somewhere and I've got some things, some notes that I've been taking lately. The way that this, so water is, is an ongoing, forever study of martial arts in whatever way we can study it. So I've looked at how Chinese martial arts, I've spent good amounts of time in Russia and China commentating and analyzing Chinese martial arts. So if you look back at earlier episodes of water, we look at how those have been dismissed by mixed martial arts in the West, even though people like Tony Ferguson are using many of these concepts. We've looked at you know how martial arts is becoming decentralized, where so anybody who, which is also why you don't want to act and sound and claim to be any kind of expert or speak from a point of expertise. Because I'll tell you, when you look in on websites or whatever, and I don't do it a lot anymore because it's very distracting and it forces you to think a certain way if you keep watching people who think a certain way. But somebody will talk and criticize martial artists as if they're saying what they're saying is absolute truth. And there are very few absolute truths in martial arts. And in fact, when you believe something's an absolute truth, like always throw the right hand before the, the jab, most people don't believe that. But once upon a time, something like that could be believed. If I do that to you, what do you know about me? You know I always throw the right hand after the jab. Therefore, this thing that was once true is now become something you victimize me for. So anyone who says, always throw the jab this way, or never throw this, if you believe I will never overextend on a punch, well, great. That's how TJ Dillashaw dropped Barrow in round one of their first fight. Barrow believed that he was at a safe distance. So it is manipulating belief systems is at the root of the highest level of martial artistry. So that's been some of the earliest stuff that we did. And this is a gift for me. Please understand, and if you are somebody who follows, and I, and I have a few, and I appreciate you, is sometimes people don't want this. They don't have to have it. I appreciate you wanting to look at martial arts this way. I appreciate you wanting to look and say, when somebody says, he's a better wrestler and he's a better striker and this guy's got bad cardio, those are all very primitive ideas, most of which are not true anymore, and most of which have been mechanisms that television uses, and you don't have to look at things that way. 
All right. So today, the the last month or two, really since you know, months before the Francis Ngannou Stipe Miocic fight, I circled back to questions about athleticism as it relates to artistry. I didn't really quite know that's where we were going, and that's often the case. Because when you are as fortunate as I am, and I don't use the word blessed because I feel like everyone overuses it, and it kind of makes me uncomfortable. It's like somebody's just saying that thing they say. But fuck, am I a lucky person, man. I literally spend my days following my curiosity and finding a way, look, searching for a nugget and sharing it. So my curiosities has been back to that, that healthy but sometimes unwilling relationship between being a better athlete and being a better martial artist. And it sounds like it shouldn't be, the word unwilling shouldn't be used, but it is. When you go in, and I've had this conversation with coaches that I highly respect on both sides. Faraz Sahabi is one that I've had this conversation with and I respect him and admire him greatly. And he heavily believes that because skill defeats all, that the maximum amount of effort should be spent on skill. That's a pretty solid, pretty solid belief. You come from the idea that, that uh, martial arts was designed to beat the bigger, stronger man. So if you spend all your time becoming bigger and stronger, and I know that's a generalization, we'll get into that. And on the other side, Faraz's brother or students spend their time becoming the better martial artist that at the root of what it is to be a martial artist, the better martial artist, the better martial arts itself was designed to be able to defeat the bigger, stronger man. So that's a very solid strategy. This is a philosophical strategy of building the fighter. On the other side is if I'm bigger and stronger and more athletic than you, I build endurance, I build the ability to fatigue you when I fatigue less, all of these athletic platform things, I will use that as a weapon and I will defeat the smaller, weaker, less athletic athlete. And the problem with this debate is both are true and both will always be true. Both will always be true. Yes, um, uh, martial arts in and of itself is there to beat the bigger, stronger man. But the bigger, stronger, more athletic, more enduranced, more nuanced athlete can use that to fatigue, weaken, or, or hurt the martial artist, who therefore later is not himself anymore and that he can't express his martial arts that way. So that's always going to be true. So this research and this exploration, re-exploration, I've been coming back to this and I will for the rest of my life because I'm deeply curious about it. Um, and it's real, you know? And a lot of the way that we, the royal we, talk about fighting, really, we act as if you're not smart enough to handle this. And I know you are. I know you are. I know we don't have to in 2018 say, bro, who's got better cardio? Oh, I think this guy's got better cardio. He's going to win round five. Cardio is not even a real thing. Cardio is a, a catch-all term. We're talking about three different energy systems. We're talking about recovery. We're talking about efficiency. We're talking about the ability to uh, use more or less energy. We're talking about burning hot or burning cold. There's a thousand variables that cannot all be described as cardio, bro. And... Neither can whose wrestling is better. These are mechanisms that television uses and they use because they don't think you can handle more. And uh, it's rude. It's disrespectful. How, co how can they assume you cannot handle more? Um, so we began with talking to uh, Francis Ngannou's coach, Fernand Lopez. And it's on the YouTube channel. You can go back and look. And we talked, he, he talked about when Francis Ngannou walks into his gym and he was the better, he was a better athlete genetically than anybody he'd ever seen. And he'd seen thousands and thousands. Fernand Lopez is the highest level of martial arts instructor in Europe. Okay, he's a brilliant man and he's a great man. And he's a cool man and he's obsessed and my kind of guy. So we chatted for a long time and he was like, he's just genetically better. I saw the way that his body moved. I saw the way he was able to use energy, direction change, the length of his musculature, all of these things. And genetically he learned quicker. And that makes me un uncomfortable at times because I know in the root of what it is to be the rest of us, part of, part of what it, it is to be driven for the rest of us is the belief that if we just work hard enough, we can progress and try to be great in our own way. 
And you all know that to be true. And anybody who's ever taught martial arts knows that to be true. If you work hard at doing this, eventually the muscle will grow. If you work hard at reading, you'll become a better reader. If you work hard at playing violin, you become a better violin player. If you study anything, you gain knowledge. If you try to jump higher and you've concentrated on it, eventually you jump way higher. We all know this to be true. And this is what is at the root of the philosophy of somebody like me who believes that I can get better every day. And life has taught me that I can. So to just look and, and accept that genetically this man is better, um, but it's true. Francis Ngannou was gifted and I don't think, however you want to phrase that, the, the, the DNA that he was given of the way that his muscles express themselves, the way that he learns, the way that his nervous system works, he is genetically has all of these advantages. Now, uh, the rest of us, if we do not, so that is nature, some call it, the rest of us, they nurture, we work harder. We grind, and through that grind, and I'm sorry I'm not seeing your questions, please ask them again at the end, please, because I'd love to try to answer some of them. But the rest of us grind. So Francis Ngannou has these genetic attributes that are incredible. Daniel Cormier and Stipe Miacic have many great genetics, you know, a lot of great genetic ability, but through grind and hard work, they improve, 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 improve. They are different. Now, so that, there are philosophical questions about that. We accept that to be true, but then we're, it bothers us. I thought, I, I thought if I worked hard enough, I could accomplish anything. That is a, the foundational truth of what I believe. And yet, Francis Ngannou was born bigger, stronger, faster, and he learns quicker and all those. So, odd, right? So, I, I started the study of where we were going to study these martial artists from this athletic platform approach with that. And that discomfort. So my friend, Dr. Tracy Trudeau, you can follow her on Twitter. Um, she sent me some background on epigenetics. Now, I'm not going to get too heavy into it because that's going, that's another branch of this conversation, but it is one that makes you comfortable with this discomfort because epigenetics is a modern study that looks at your genetic code, looks at your DNA and says that how and when your DNA is expressed is dependent on other factors health food thought emotion you know rest all of these things so the genes so this will be my last thought and we'll move on to other things the genes are the blueprint and the epigenetics are the contractor okay so how what you do does affect how because there are genetically brilliant people who are you know, obviously, you know, let's say a sick drug addict living on the street. You know, what they've taken and done, they are not Francis Ngannou because of the choices that they've made, what they've taken into their body, how they've thought, how they've trained, their belief systems are even part of it. The brain, all of that affects it. So that's a whole other thing for another day, but it's fascinating. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. The other branch of where this went was when I talked to Dr. Stu McGill. Dr. Stu McGill, is as I've said many times, and I'm going to do a, some work with him. We're going to shoot with John Chamberg in Montreal, some very fascinating high level science shit for this YouTube channel. And that's going to be coming up late April or so. It's going to be fascinating. But so Dr. Stu wanted to talk to me about, let's say, Stipe, and we can say the same about Cormier, but for now, actually, yeah, for now, let's say Stipe and Francis, that they're different. So you have, you start with a hypothesis. The hypothesis that Fernand Lopez took with Francis Ngannou was he is a genetic fast twitch athlete. So fast twitch, hey guys, please uh, send your questions at the end and tell others I'd love to take them at the end. There, again, as a quick recap before I get to uh, Francis the fast twitch athlete, is this is all I'm bringing you in today is my, where my curiosity has taken me in study. The spoiler alert is, we do not have answers at the end of today. I'm going to take you to where we are in our study, and we get to the front end of these high-level minds and the questions that they can answer, and I actually have them exploring some of these ideas, some of which we will explore with John Chamberg's, um, uh, strength and, John Chamberg's strength and conditioning coach who trains, you know, the Pittsburgh 
the Penguins and George St. Pierre and Roy McDonald, many of them. So Stu, Dr. Stu says we got um, Francis Ngannou, who is a fast twitch athlete. And I say, yeah, he has fast twitch fibers. And he says, no, 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 no. It's not fibers. The fast twitch neurology, that, that a punch, a kick, me picking this up, it's all physical, but it all starts with a thought. Everything you do, every choice you make, begins with a thought. And when Francis fades back to throw that punch, that begins with a thought. That thought travels, forms quicker, and travels through his, from his brain, through his nervous system, out to his nerves to be expressed faster. Fast twitch. Beautiful. And they've measured this. This is high level science into real. Very easily measured. It's going to be part of the research we do uh, in Montreal with John Chamber. Then he's able to do it quicker. Now, Stipe, Cormier, many others, they are not, they don't have that genetic advantage. So our hypothesis is we will work them and grind them. Okay? So we become, we build our endurance, we build our our aerobic and anaerobic thresholds, all of these aspects get built. But we will never be as fast twitch. We will never be as explosive off the line as say a Chad Mendez. And, uh, or say, you know, Uriah Faber to some degree now, or George St. Pierre in the early days. Now you see these people change. That'll be a part of this conversation. Conor McGregor, Conor McGregor, when you're taking everybody out in round one or two, it's because you have that, that, that fast twitch neurology. You're able to do that. So what happens with that? So the hypothesis, Francis's fast twitch is correct. It matches the neurology. In other words, it's true. So then we begin to train appropriately. It isn't arm curls and shoulder presses. It's not hypertrophy. If you see any of that conversation, there's just people who haven't really done much research and do a little too much talking from a point of, of expertise. We don't want to talk from expertise. We want to talk from curiosity, ask the experts and travel that information. We, there's the world is full of a whole lot of people just arguing about shit that neither one of them knows a lot about. And if we just were more curious and asked a lot more questions, just pass on whatever the information we learn to later learn new information, we'd all be a little better off and happier, I might add. Be a lot happier. Sidebar, why do we do this? TV taught us to do it. I turn on the TV, I was just in Orlando. It's here in Canada too, it's in Russia when I travel. But you turn it on, on ESPN, it's Charles Barkley or Shaq or whoever arguing with three other guys. No, I think it's this. No, I think it's that. You turn on CNN, there's five people arguing about shit. You turn on anywhere. We've been taught through television that the highest level of being fucking whatever is arguing. So we all act like we know everything and then we argue about it. And then we think the other one's crazy. And neither, neither one of us knows shit. So we have those two athletes. Sorry. Francis Ngannou fast twitch athlete, we start training him that way. Now, what's the key to that? We want to, why could he take out everybody like that? Because he was defiantly sudden and quick. Even a guy like an Overeem, who had, Overeem has seen it all. Overeem was prepared, ready, talented, brilliant. And you see, and don't, don't get me started about our misunderstanding of someone's chin either. With that head almost came off. Anybody's out with that. He shouldn't have been hit with that by anyone else. But he was unable to be able to track and see it because it happened so quickly. It's off time. It's done. There are things, and I've broken them down for TSN. That you might be able to see it at tsn.ca slash UFC, where Ngannou is in positions of pure inefficiency, still able to knock you out because that level of explosive expression is so powerful that even off balance what happens when you're inefficient and off balance is it bleeds some of that force well the force is so high that even when you bleed some of it away with inefficiency it's still enough to knock out everybody how do you train that you train it in bursts you train it in explosive bursts everything's about that you're maximizing it it's like a, a greyhound you know, those, you don't run a greyhound for 40 minutes. You run a greyhound for four minutes and you let them sleep. It's like a sumo. Sumo go out and then they, they explode for minutes and then they sleep. And that is a key to training in Ghana. Okay? And we'll leave that there for now. I'm going to come back to it. Dan Cormier, Stipe, many others, they don't have that. They're not born with that. They're not 
their, their neurology isn't like his. And Anderson Silva and George had that. Connor has that to some degree, to some degree. There's variations. These are not black and white. Almost nothing is black and white. Please, if you take only one thing away from our conversation today to think about, almost nothing is binary. He's either got good cardio or bad cardio. He's either good wrestler or bad wrestler. He's either fast twitch or slow twitch. Uh, Francis is the highest expression of fast twitch, but most of us sit somewhere in here. Michael Bisping is a true middle distance runner. Fast twitch is a sprinter. Um, Dan Cormier, uh, maybe the best example, Nick Diaz is, an, is a marathon runner as a fighter, and Mike Bisping is this middle distance runner. So we train him like that. Now we take Dan Cormier or Stipe and we train the grind. We make them grind. We teach them to grind. We make them embrace the grind in, all, in the cliche. And we go and we build ourselves a strength endurance athlete. We'll never be as fast or strong or explosive as this man. But he, and we'll sacrifice some of that, but he will be his own greatness. He will be a, you can be a super athlete of a different kind. Okay, now that's great. So I thought, Robin, I thought you said nothing's binary, nothing's like that. If we've approached him to maximize these things, we train him like that. We, you know, five minute burn, and well, we're doing five minute rounds, so let's work him hard for five minutes and then break, and then five minutes and then break. Stipe may work for 20 minutes of work. He may work for 30, he may work for 15, he may do seven minute rounds. He may never express at this level of explosiveness, but why do this? Because we can knock guys out in the first two minutes. It's real, we can do it, it happens. And this is not new to him. Kevin Randleman was one of these guys. There was a million of these guys in the early days. Push, explode, destroy, and if we don't get it, you out of there, well then we'll deal with it. Now why do we do this? What, the next question would be, why don't we just Train his endurance, his cardio. Why don't we like make him, you know, why don't we improve that? And I'll tell you why, and it's quite simple. Take the world's greatest sprinter and get him running marathons. He's never gonna be a great marathon runner, but more importantly, he's going to become a worse sprinter. We're going to have to sacrifice. He will be a worse sprinter. Even if we keep him sprinting but do that, we're changing his neurology. It's not just an attribute in a video game. And EA Sports, the uh, UFC game is fun. I got to be involved in its development. It was really exciting. It's a great game. And any other video game like that where you see those attributes, super cool. But that's not real life. That's not real life. And it's not real life when you see it on UFC.com and this guy's got cardio this, strength that, wrestling this. It's not like that. Everything is interconnected. If we make his endurance better, we, we will, uh, we will f uh, reduce his ability as an explosive athlete in those minutes. So his sprinting ability, in other words, his ability to be massively destructive in those first few minutes, will degrade. So this is where we are, okay? So this is what I've learned. This is what I've gathered and much more research to do. Joel Jameson, reaching out to him soon. He is the world's foremost expert. Uh, somebody said they're lost. Okay, I'm gonna recap one more time, very simply as best I can. And, and if you are lost, that's my fault. Because if you cannot explain something so that your grandmother or a six-year-old can understand it, then you don't know it well enough. And that means I don't know it well enough. But let's, let's try to recap in a very simple way. Uh, Francis Ngannou is a sprinter, okay? We train him like a sprinter. He's fast twitch. His neurology is fast twitch. He is to train him to be fast, explosive, and in ways that others can't handle, like the way he took out over him, is to train a sprinter. Daniel Cormier or Stipe Miocic, they are somewhere between a middle distance runner and a long distance runner. And we train them as such. We train them to last a long time. They will never beat the sprinter in a sprint. They will never accelerate as fast off the line. They will never jump as high or explode as fast. Never. But they will do these other things. If we train Francis Ngannou to be better at this, endurance, we will make him a worse sprinter. We will make him not as explosive. It will affect that because of the nature of how the neurology is combined. Okay, so have we, I think I've explained that better, I hope. So if we make Francis, and we can, we can absolutely go and make Francis better in the fourth and fifth rounds, no question about it. But when we do that, 
and we will do that now. We will slowly degrade his abilities to be explosive, destructive, and fast, and deceptively sudden in ways that even an Overeem, one of the most experienced heavyweights in the world, couldn't handle. Okay, so we will degrade that. So I'm, thank you for having me reset that because that brings me to the most interesting part for me. And this is where I'm, the next research is. George St. Pierre, there's others, but George St. Pierre went with John Chainberg, who was his main strength and condition coach. And George was a super athlete. George was a fast twitch killer athlete and he wanted to be better in rounds four and five. And they went and Dr. Stu, my friend Dr. Stu was a part of this. The question was, how do we determine how much, how far above that destructive line we are? That line that enough force is expressed to knock out everybody. If that is this for 90% of people and we're way up here, are we able to sacrifice enough of that to keep George as a super explosive athlete or Connor would be seeking this and is moving in that direction with the last fight with Nate Diaz, but not as good at it as, as um, George. If we take our more, exp more force created than we need to knock out everybody, because that's here, and we sacrifice to here to raise this. How do we measure that in a martial artist? How do we help create that? And that is where we get back to artistry versus athleticism. The more efficient and more skilled that George or Francis or whoever is making this adjustment in what it is, the biochemistry of, of, of martial arts expression, the more efficient and skilled they become, the less of that we'll need. Now remember, so I'm hoping that you're following me. Remember, Francis, as I said earlier, has such a level of, of ability to create force that even off balance, the forces here, the inefficiency puts it, it here still enough to knock out guys. So he's way off balance when he knocked out Arlovsky. No problem. This is what it would take, the force it would take to knock out Arlovsky. We make this much force, even while inefficient, we still create this much force. That's enough force to knock out Arlovsky, right? So what if we make Francis or George or whoever, who is a super athlete with this ability to create force that knocks people out, and we make, we build their skill development more expression, smooth, greased grooves, more fluid, more flowy, with Artem, uh, keep it flowy. If and when we do that, we don't need as much ex uh, explosiveness, so that can allow us to then, so we make a, a trade-off. We slowly s allow that, uh, that explosiveness, that fast twitch, that, that first two minutes of death, we allow that to degrade slightly, and we build the endurance. And we, we have degraded that to enough of a level that if we also improve our skills, we still have plenty of gas to knock people out. Okay, is it making sense? I'm gonna wind out of this and start to take some questions. My vision is bad, so I will have to get a little closer. Needs to say some yoga. So yoga is a very valuable thing in a lot of ways. Um, Guys, I'm really sorry, my vision is terrible, so I'm not super able to see these questions, but I'm gonna do my best now. So, uh, let, me, let me finish off that say, will I be in Vegas for 226? Maybe. Let me finish off by saying that this is still very much a study. It will be for a long time. And please remember, there is no black and white, there's no binary, there's no zeros and ones in this. Okay, we study them this way because they're easier to understand. But most things are shades of gray. Is Tyron Woodley fast twitch or slow twitch? Is Michael Bisping fast twitch or slow twitch? Is Dominic Cruz? There are blends in there. And even as we start to focus in on this, we have to keep our mind open that we use mobility to create power. Power is created in different ways. So these things will go on forever. And the more we know, the more questions we get. Because as we get questions, now I go to Dr. Stu and I, and I ask him, is it different on your body, your brain, and your neurology to train a skill, like throwing a punch, than it is to train uh, speed or explosiveness or power 
or vertical leap. And he didn't have a clean answer for that necessarily, but I'm sure he will, and I'm gonna be able to pick his brain a lot more in the future, especially when we go shoot at John Chambers. I'm gonna ask Rory McDonald if he will be a subject when we shoot in Montreal, by the way. Rory, if you happen to see this, and if you do, I can't believe you hung in all this long because you know all this stuff. The best athletes know all, everything I just said here. This is not some cockamamie shit I'm coming up with. This is standard understanding. These are the conversations had by athletes and coaches. When you open up a website or you put on the Fox desk or you watch people talk on Twitter, these are the conversations outside of the realm of fighting. The conversations I'm hope, trying to share with you in water are the conversations that you have with the John Danner or the conversations you have with Duke Rufus, or the conversations you have with a Farad Sahabi, or a Dr. Stu, or Joel Jameson, or any of these highest level people. These are real things. These are not Robin's cockamamie ideas. But, uh, so I asked him, last thought, and then we'll, we'll do some questions. I asked him about skill development and athletic platform development, and are they learned different by your body? And he cited a research study. Hey, France, what? Thanks, man. I, hey, listen, a lot of people say a lot of kind things, and, and it's encouraging because I know that there are, we are going to places that people are curious about. There are a lot of people who feel like they're being talked down to by a lot of what's out there, or they look at it and go, I can't believe everyone keeps having the same conversation. It is not a breakdown to just two people argue about who, who this guy's a better kicker, no, this guy's a better kicker. We're trying to, we're trying to dig in. By the way, I like my Korean zombie shirt. Um, but uh, so Dr. Stu, I asked him about the athletic development versus skill development. And he cited a, um, he cited a, uh, a study done, I believe, at the University of Toronto by somebody that he worked with in the past. And they used firefighters. And two groups of firefighters trained for a set amount of time. I don't know the exact time. Let's just pretend it's 10 weeks, but I don't know. Those two firefighters, one of them did the, the specific technical skill development that firefighters use. They pull they pull things, they climb up, they, they get the rope, they shoot the thing, whatever. They do firefighter shit. The other group does, and this is my term for it, um, um, what's that thing, you know, Reebok, uh, the, uh, anyways, they, they do fitness stuff. They do fitness stuff. I, CrossFit. Stu would never say this. The researchers would never say this. They'd never use that because that is somebody else's term. But I'm using it just as a general idea because we, we all kind of know what that is. Hard work of many different kinds. S strength, conditioning, speed, etc. Um, I don't have a predisposed positive or negative view of it. I think exercise is a beautiful thing. Um, but I'm using it as a generalization. So, so one group of firefighters did firefighter shit, training for long periods of time. The other one did... Great fitness level, great level fitness training. And then they both went and tested them, doing, you know, a series of firefighter tests. I don't know how similar to this they were. Of course, these ones were more efficient, but they also were injured less. So they did specific skill development for firefighting and not against people who did high level athletic training and not surprising, they did better. So oh, that supports, if you go, if you've been here with me from the beginning and I talked about Firas and, and many others, Firas is a genius and there are many geniuses who agree with him that skill development beats all. That is the firefighter training. That's kicking and punching and grappling and, and uh, stand-ups and takedowns and, and wrestling and fighting people off the choke and all of that. And then on this side, we train athletics. Now, of course, what the best do is find that blend that suits them. And in the long run, you've seen it from Matt Hughes, super athlete, George, all these super athletes. When that went on too long, you know, all of a sudden the Stephen Thompsons and the Holly Holmes of the world come along and it's more skill oriented. Stephen Thompson and Holly Holm, great athletes too, but not like the, not like the, you know, the mega athletes uh, that are out there. Okay, so then the, the game goes that way and everyone starts to take a little less time in the strength and conditioning gym and developing some of these skills. But once everybody has those skills and the skills are all, if everybody can get to 95th percentile and you work a little harder at skill development and can get to 99th, some of those 95th percentile people will become bigger, stronger, and more athletic. They'll be able to beat you. And so the game moves that way. Sometimes it's about skill development because the skill development advances so high you can beat the athletes. The, the, the heavy, more athletes on this side because they're all athletes, great athletes. 
Other times, the skill development starts to plateau and we're all pretty good at it and everybody understands it and your coach knows what my coach knows and it's kind of there for a little while and then being a little, and the, some of this, it'll be one or two athletic skills that develop. The one for the last few years, direction change. Feel very, very much better at quick direction change. I've done lots of breakdowns on Stipe, you know. My man Dominic Cruz has used that athletic ability for a decade to be the best in the world. And most people watched him do it and didn't study it, which is insane. Absolutely insane. Everybody watched Dominic Cruz and said, that's really cool, he can do it. But, you know, he's just, no, he's just a human being that worked really hard. You could do it too. Finally, people do now do aspects of what he did. Uh, Dom's just brilliant and used specialized in particular athletic abilities that, co that, that really complemented his mind. In fact, love you, Dominic Cruz, man. Learned so much from watching you. So that's where we are. Water, the study of martial arts. I hope I've given you some questions. I know I haven't given you many answers. Um, but that's what this is going to be about. So please excuse my face being this close. Um, and let's take some questions. Habib and McG McGregor have to fight. Yeah, very interesting. Habib is an endurance athlete, too. Habib's not a fast twitch guy. He's, uh, he's a guy, he'll be a middle distance runner. The best, I believe, are those guys. Michael Bisping, you, people have, because they don't always like him, people have wondered, well, how's Michael Bisping so good? In, or they say he's not so good. Best form of martial arts for a police officer. Probably grappling of all kinds. And Ganu is 31, does he have time? Absolutely, heavyweights are in the prime at 38, 39. Montreal hang out soon, my friend. May, let's try to do it. I'm there May, I'm there in March for TKO 42, and then I'm in May to shoot this. So we will do a Montreal hangout for sure. Question, your thoughts on Mighty Mouse and DJ? Should DJ defend title against Mighty Mouse? Oh, you mean TJ. Love to see that fight. Love to see that fight. Uh, TJ and um, our boy was pretty exciting. When will you be in Saskatchewan? I don't know when I'll be in Saskatchewan. Hey, before I answer some more questions, thank you guys so much for hanging with me. It's incredible pleasure to be able to do this. When the chips are down in a fight, who would be stronger mental, the artist or the athlete? That's a really great question. Can Please hold off on the other ones. Really great question. I love the way you're thinking. Please uh, hold off, guys. And if you do ask me a question that I don't see, feel free to ask it again. That's a great question. There is an argument to be made that mental strength and it's not even an argument. There's plenty of proof that mental strength is developed by being constantly challenged. Being constantly challenged and overcoming challenge. Proving to yourself. Getting the experience of it. So the people who grind, really grind. They're hurt. They're overcoming pain, exhaustion, fatigue, whatever. They're training their mind. And uh, in a lot of cases, well, you know, that's... That's a fucking great question because the martial artist can train that by never giving up on that joke, by fighting his way through pain, by fighting his way through fatigue, he's training that. The athlete will, who is, and please remember, these are not cut and dry, it's not zeros and ones, it's not black and white, um, but the athletic t tilt on that is you grind your way through the last rep, that last hour, that last hill, that last whatever, and truthfully, you gotta think again, the blend of both is the key because you make, you make the grind and make being mentally strong a habit. You become unbreakable by repetition. You become anti-fragile. It's a great book, by the way, anti-fragile. The opposite of fragile is not robust. Robust as in you can handle it, the opposite is stronger becoming stronger by challenge and that's what happens so if you do that on a hill and you do that on the treadmill and you do that in the weight room and you do that you know in the strength and conditioning and you do it when you're being choked and you do it when you're hurt and you do it when you're bloodied the more different ways you got to think is valuable so i love that question and i don't know that there's a an, anybody who has an answer for that i also think that ridiculous thing we've been talking about about how people just argue on television and it's become a thing that we think it's normal. Uh, you could see, you know, Bisping and Florian or, or any two 
Um, and it's not their fault. I, please don't hold. I'm, I admire and respect all these great martial artists. But if somebody's in their ear saying, Mike, I need you to take the other side, they could argue on TV and you think that's normal. It's, ah, no, the athlete will be... And they wouldn't because this is out of the realm of, of what you'd see on that. But, ah, oh, the athlete will be better. No, the martial artist. Don't argue. Don't argue over that. Don't pick a side. You don't know anything about it. I've studied this for the last few decades, m m much of my life. And I can tell you I don't know the answer to that. I can tell you that's an exciting thing. Real exciting thing. Um, is there any way Shevchenko loses tomorrow night? Yeah, of course. I'm a huge fan. How can a normal person see and understand fighting just like you? Any thoughts on the record low UFC Fox numbers? Fox is out of the deal, so there's a business element to it. And... If, they, if these people don't stop talking down to their audience, the audience is going to keep going away. You can't just keep selling me the same thing over and over and over. The winner gets a title shot. Is this the heaviest puncher we've ever seen? Oh my God, this guy. You can't just keep selling me spectacle because the spectacle wears off. You got to teach me something. You got to get me excited. You got to make it be meaningful. You got to connect with me. You got to let me see this is about human potential and growth. You got to make me, you got to do all these things. And hey, it's my man, Matt De La Rosa. I love you, man. Uh, Matt popped up on my phone. Uh, he said I'm looking lean and mean. I have actually been training a lot. Uh, he may not be on here, by the way. <laughs> he might have just seen my Instagram thing. Um, but Matt, I love a lot. He is, uh, he's the guy who has put together that art piece that you see and been, been curating it and, and lovingly working on it that you see between the prelims and the main card. You know that Who song and that... And, forest and and uh, all of it it's a beautiful thing i love matt de la rosa there's some great people down at the ufc i want to work with them more this year i'm gonna work with them more but so anyways i've spent enough time here it is a real gift you guys give me to be able to do this a real true gift and i love it and uh uh, this is going to be an exciting year for me. I'm going to be, I think, doing some stuff for KSW. I like to do some things for ACB. I'm commentating TKO. Uh, I do a lot of work for, for TSN up here in Canada. I'm doing one-minute breakdowns every day on Instagram. I got one up on how Robbie, uh, Bobby Knuckles, Robert Whitaker, dropped Tavares. Please check that out, at Robin Black MMA. It's also on Twitter. And, uh, yeah. Thank you guys for letting me do what I do, and thank you guys for encouraging me. I can't thank you enough. I really can't. And I hope to be back Monday, shoot a bunch of things for next week. Please follow Instagram. I got a new one-minute breakdown every day. I do it first thing in the morning, and it is a pleasure. Thank you guys so much. I love you. Blackout.